Well, I'm so excited this evening for the subject that we're going to be exploring, but I, I really feel the need for, for God's special intervention on my behalf, on our behalf. So would you just pause with me one more time as we pray? Father in heaven, we want nothing more, God, than to know you as you really are. There's a lot of darkness and, and misconception in our world about you and in our own hearts. What we do know of you is extremely attractive, God. We've seen your beauty in Christ, and we find ourselves drawn to you. But God, I pray that you would liberate us this evening in this, our final time together, that you would free us from every misconception that hangs around in our hearts and keeps us emotionally shut down from you. Father, we don't want to be at a distance from you. Please break the power of legalistic religion and formalistic religion and cultural religion. Just, Father, please break us free and help us to see you in all your goodness and to fall in love with you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin this evening by asking you a question. Have you ever had a recurring dream? Anybody? Over and over again, the same dream. I understand from the literature I've read on it because I decided to look into it because I had the experience as a little boy. I understand that it's a very rare occurrence. A very small segment of the population will have the same exact dream repeat over and over and over again. But I had that experience as a little boy. I grew up in Southern California, and in Los Angeles, the ocean was right there. I was a little boy, so I was somewhat afraid of the ocean. But I heard rumors of a beautiful, majestic creature that lived in the ocean. I also heard about the sharks and all of the scary creatures as a little boy. But man, oh man, there was this one creature, and my mom showed me pictures of this beautiful creature and told me that this creature is friendly and, and it's the only creature in the ocean that actually smiles. Do you know what I'm talking about? I was fixated as a little boy. I was obsessed with dolphins. And I wanted to see a dolphin so bad that I had a dream over and over and over again. And in my dream, I would see myself as a little boy coming to the ocean. And in my dream, I would see the waves breaking at my feet, and I would feel the fear of going into the ocean because of the scary creatures that I knew were there. And in my dream, feeling all that fear, and yet fear mixed with desire to encounter firsthand this beautiful creature. In my dream, as I would stand there over and over again, what an experience it was in my imagination because the dolphin would come up out of the water, circle around from behind, straight through the air, come up under me as a little boy, I'd find myself on the dolphin's back, holding the dorsal fin, and off into the ocean we went. And we would go down, plunging deep, and then coming up for a breath of air, down and up, and just all the other creatures that I saw under the water and then coming up and seeing the blue sky and the birds. And then in my dream, I mean, dreams are like this. It got crazy. The dolphin would come up out of the ocean and begin to fly up through the city streets of Los Angeles. And as a little boy, I'd be on the back of this dolphin just waving at the people, me and my dolphin, just waving as we would just go through the city and into buildings and up to the second, third, fourth, fifth floor and then down and back into the ocean, and then he'd set me free, and I'd be standing on the ocean again. Over and over again, I had that dream. It was so delightful. At some point, the dream stopped. Fast forward some 20 years, and this desire to be with dolphins, really, not just in my dreams, was still there. And I was on a tropical island, me, my wife, our children, and we had a host. And I said, hey, do you know anybody on the island that has a boat? He said, well, I have a boat. I said, well, could we go out on your boat and see dolphins? And he said, ah, people live on this island their whole life and they never see dolphins. 
but I'll take you out on my boat. It's highly unlikely that we'll see dolphins. And in my heart, I'm secretly saying, you don't know what's going on here, man. God is very fond of me. <laughs> he knows my dream. And I think, I didn't say any of this out loud. It might sound kind of weird. So I say, yeah, let's just go out on your boat. So we go out on this guy's boat, I don't know, three quarters of a mile, a mile from shore. And we're just sitting in the boat, and finally, the weather begins to change. It's starting to drizzle a little bit. We've been out there for an hour. We haven't seen dolphins. We're looking. We still haven't seen them. He says, you know what? It's getting, it's getting a little choppy. We, we probably should go back. I say, can we wait a little bit longer? I, I don't mind the drizzle. I mean, we're in the ocean. We're already wet. Who cares? He said, all right, we'll stay out a little bit longer. Still no dolphins. He says, we better go back. And just as he says, we better go back the second time, you would not believe what happened. My little girl, Leah, she says, Daddy, look. And we all look in the same direction off the shore, off the, the edge of the boat, and we just see ever so briefly these sharp, dark colored fins up and gone. In my mind, I say, dolphins. So I dive in and I begin swimming toward where I saw the fin as my wife is screaming, what if they're sharks? <laughs> and in my mind, I'm saying, I don't care. I'm swimming with dolphins, one way or another. And I begin swimming for all I'm worth in that direction. And I go under and I look and I see nothing. And this was very clear, clear water. Crystal clear. I didn't come up for breath, go down again. I don't see anything. Up again, go. And suddenly, the third time that I look under the water, one, two, three, four, five, six, I count six dolphins right in front of me. Oh, you think that's amazing. I'm not done with this story. <laughs> so I come up for air and I scream at my family, they are dolphins. Plop, 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 plop. They all jump in. My daughter with her underwater camera. And they all begin swimming in my direction, and I go down again, and there they are. One, two, three, four, five. I lost count at around 50. They were everywhere. And then I got really mad at all the litterers of the world because one of the dolphins had a plastic bag on its face. And I was feeling angry at the world, as you would have, right? And then I noticed that that dolphin that had the bag on its face passed it to the next one, who passed it to the next one, who passed it to the next one. It was a toy. They had found this plastic bag, and I felt kind of all right about the litterers at that point. I thought, you know what? We're providing the dolphins with toys. But I don't actually believe that. But it was kind of fun to just watch them play. Finally, my family gets tired, and they go back to the boat. They're wimps, all of them. And I keep swimming as fast as I can in the direction along the shoreline where the dolphins are swimming. I kid you not, God is my witness, and I believe in the investigative judgment, so this is the truth. <laughs> I'm swimming along the shoreline, and those dolphins, as they do, come up to the surface to get air all around me. They're in front of me, they're to each side, they're behind me, and I'm swimming in a school of dolphins. Wow is right. And as I'm swimming, they go down again and they come up. And I think, you know what, I'm getting tired. I'm not a dolphin, I'm a human. And I look for the boat and the water is getting choppy. And at one point I see it, at another point I don't. I'm thinking, I better go back. So I turn around to begin swimming back toward the boat. And these dolphins, all of them in unison, circled around and surrounded me as if to say with their body language, hey dude, we're going this way. <laughs> so I turned around and kept swimming with them as long as I could take it. And what I was experiencing was the fulfillment of my dream. I was experiencing 
something so glorious that the only way that I can describe it to you is when I had that experience, I felt, and this language is going to become important for us this evening, I felt, here's the language, are you ready for it? I felt fully alive. I felt so engaged with the God of the universe and the things that he had made that it was glorious. It was so amazing. That was my recurring dream. Now, what I want to share with you this evening, and you're going to have to track with me because we're going to cover a lot of territory now. Not only did I have a recurring dream, but in Scripture, listen, there is a recurring dream. As far as I can tell, and I've searched the Bible, this is the only prophecy that is repeated over and over and over again. It's a prophetic dream. Multiple prophets saw exactly the same thing, going all the way back to the first canonical prophet, Moses himself. And so here's the first time the vision, the dream, occurs in Scripture. And it's God speaking to Moses, and God says in this prophecy to Moses, Numbers 14, 21, check this out, Truly, God says, as I live, this is God swearing an oath by himself, as truly as I live, God says, all the earth shall be filled with the what? Say it out loud with me. The glory of the Lord. So here's a prophecy. Hey, Moses, write this down. There's coming a day when the whole earth will be illuminated with the glory of the Lord, whatever that means. We don't know what it means yet. We're about to find out what it means. But right now, it's just this provocative prophecy. What does it mean? Well, then, look at this one. This is from Psalm 97 in verse 6. This is the prophet David under inspiration. And David says, the heavens declare his righteousness, and all the peoples see his what? His glory, so here's another prophet under inspiration, and he says here, not the earth like Moses, the earth, well, God isn't interested in terra firma, he's interested in his glory being known by cognitive, sentient creatures like you and me, men and women who can think and feel. So here, the prophecy under David's crafting of the words, he's under inspiration, he says, all peoples will see the glory of God. There's going to be some kind of point in history in which the glory of God goes viral on planet Earth. A universal vision of the glory of God. Okay, check this out. Here's the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah says, arise, he's talking to the people of God, prophetically, arise and do what? Shine. There's a word of, of illumination. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory, there's our word that we're interested in, the glory of the Lord is risen upon you, for behold, check this out, this is prophetic, Isaiah's adding details that Moses didn't give us, he's adding details that David didn't give us, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness, the people. Now, the glory of God is being held in contrast here to something called darkness. And this isn't the kind of darkness you get when the sun goes down and you flip the light switch off. This is psychological, emotional darkness. This is darkness regarding the character of God. The prophecy goes on and says that, that darkness will cover the whole earth. So deception and a picture of God that is not worthy of him is going to be universal. Human beings generally are going to believe horrific things about God. That's what the prophecy is telling us. Darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness the people, but, qualification, that's what that grammar is for, but the Lord will arise upon you and his glory, God's glory, will be seen where, everybody? On you, on God's people. So we've gone from Moses saying the earth will be filled with the glory of God, David saying that the glory of God will be revealed universally to all people, 
And now we're told that there is going to be some glorious manifestation that is going to banish the darkness of misconception of God's character. And this glory, whatever it is, we haven't identified it yet, will be seen upon God's people. And what will happen? A very large, massive evangelistic influx is going to happen when that glory is seen. Gentiles will come to your light, people of God. Gentiles, unbelievers, will come. They will be drawn. They will be attracted to this glory that will be upon you. Gentiles will come to your light. And kings, rulers of the world, will come to the brightness of the rising of God's people revealing his glory. What a prophecy. Don't you want to be a part of the fulfillment of this prophecy. Now watch this. Ezekiel, another Old Testament prophet, same prophecy. It's a recurring dream. Ezekiel 43, verses 1 and 2. Afterward, he brought me, this is an angel that's guiding him through his vision, through his dream. He brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. That's significant with regards, for the Bible students here, I think all of you, compare that with chapter 7, of Revelation. Afterwards, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east, and behold, watch this, the glory of the God of Israel, the what of the God of Israel, everybody? The glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice, the voice of God, was like the sound of what? Pause right there. What do waters symbolize in Scripture? People, according to Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, and many other texts. So now the glory of God is a voice. The glory of God is being revealed in the voice of many waters or many people. Many people are speaking and articulating and testifying something about the glory of God. And notice the final line. And the earth did what? It shone with God's glory through the collective corporate voice of God's people. This is an amazing prophecy, would you agree? But it's not even done yet. I'm just giving you a smattering of this prophecy over and over and over again. Look at this from Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth, again, universal language, the earth will be filled with the knowledge, that's a new word for us, so far, it's been through people, upon people, and it's illuminating the earth. Now, this glory is in the form of what? Knowledge. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's going to be cognitive. It's going to be intellectual. It's going to be emotional. What is the target of this glory? Human hearts and minds. God, in other words, is going to be perceived as God really is. The darkness is going to be lifted. People are going to have an encounter with the God of the universe through a global movement that's going to clarify who God really is. There's going to be knowledge that's going to be dropped upon this world and its inhabitants. Sole Dio Gloria. This is the final sola of the Protestant Reformation. Sola Scriptura, we discovered on night one. Sola Gratia, the grace of God alone. Sola Fide, and then what? Solo Cristo, and now the final of the glories in the Protestant Reformation, to the glory of God alone. What does it mean? What does this mean? That God is to be glorified, that God is to be receiving glory. Is God an egomaniac? Is God a cosmic narcissist? Does God want people standing at attention for all of eternity, telling him how great he is in order to stroke his ego? Is God insecure in himself? Does he actually need you and me to tell him he's wonderful? That's not what's going on at all. When the Bible speaks of God's glory filling the earth, when the Bible speaks of God being glorified, it's not talking at all about God being an egocentric kind of God, contrary to what many people believe. This is Brad Pitt. He was raised in a, a good Protestant home in the Midwest. 
And in that Protestant home, he got an impression that caused him to back up from God. He regards himself now as an unbeliever, but notice Brad Pitt articulates the reason for his unbelief. He says, I don't understand this idea of a God who says, you have to acknowledge me, you have to say that I'm the best, then I will give you eternal happiness. And if you won't, then you don't get in. It seems, he says, to be about what? Ego, and I can't see God operating from ego, so it made no sense to me. Is God an egomaniac? No, no, what we're about to discover, watch this. What is the glory of God in Scripture? Because that's our theme this evening. We've seen this recurring prophecy through many, many prophets over and over again. The whole earth is going to be filled with the glory of God. The whole earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. The whole earth is going to encounter the glory of God in many voices. Okay, what is this glory of God? Check this out. The Bible is so clear. Moses asked the question that all of us are probably asking right now because we've looked at all these prophetic words. Glory, glory, glory. God is to be glorified. Why? What? What are we talking about here? Moses said to the Lord, please show me your glory. It's a very, very straightforward question, right? So God responds and says, okay. He answers in the affirmative. He says, okay, Moses, I'll show you my glory. I will make all my what? Say the word out loud. My goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. So in answer to the question, show me your glory, God shows his what? His goodness. God is good in himself. God is good, people, and his glory isn't a function of an inflated ego. His glory is, in fact, the essence of his goodness. To say that the whole earth is going to be filled with the glory of God is to say that the whole earth is going to be filled with a knowledge of how truly good God is over against all the false pictures of God that have been painted for the world. But scripture's even more clear. Psalm 97, verse 6 again. Notice, this is what's called a Hebrew couplet. It's a form of, of poetry where Words are spoken, and then there is a repeat with slightly different language, so you have a series of synonyms that occur in this prophecy, in this form of poetry, excuse me. The heavens declare his what? Say the word out loud. Righteousness, and all peoples will see his what? So, what is the glory of God according to this passage? It's the righteousness of God. That's right. Now watch this one. This is Psalm, what is it? Psalm 115, verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto your name give what? Glory, and then notice the language very carefully. Because of your mercy, because of your truth. So in this passage, God's glory is synonymous with what? Mercy and truth. By the way, the word truth there in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word emeth, and it does not mean propositional doctrinal statements. This is, this, the propositional formulating of truth is not actually found in scripture. It's a much later development in church history coming out of the Enlightenment and the Reformation where you, where you list truth in didactic form. When this word is used, that God is a God of glory, therefore God is a God of mercy and truth, the word is emeth, E-M-E-T-H, and the word literally means truth in the sense of true. God is faithful, in other words. God is a God of relational integrity. That's what the verse is saying. The glory of God is the merciful way in which he treats fallen human beings. That's his glory. It's his mercy. It's his faithfulness. It's his trueness to us even when we're untrue to him. That's the glory of God. But how about this one? What about Isaiah 28, verse 5? I love this one. Notice again, in that day, the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of what? Glory and a diadem of what? Beauty to the remnant of his people. So the word glory is here held in as a synonym of what word? Beauty. God's glory is God's beauty. 
Now, it's not talking about aesthetic beauty. It's not talking about the way he looks, his jawline, the symmetry of his eyebrows. It's not talking about that kind of beauty. It's talking about the beauty of God's character. That is to say, the, the beauty of the way God thinks and feels and behaves. That's the idea. Now, this is amazing. Now we've come from the Old Testament. Just come on over into the New Testament. And what's our key word that we're looking at this evening? Glory. So now Jesus comes into the world, God in the flesh, and Scripture says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his what? His glory. Now watch how glory is defined here. We beheld his glory, and the glory that we see in Jesus is the glory of who? It's the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So the glory, the beauty, the righteousness, the faithfulness that we see in Christ is whose glory? It's the glory of the Father's. Notice this. The text says that his glory is the glory of the Father, and now the glory is defined as consisting of two beautiful attributes that are held in balance, grace and truth. God's glory is his righteousness, his beauty, his grace, his mercy, his truth. So when we speak of the glory of God filling the earth, we're talking about a mass communications venture. We're talking about a revelatory enterprise. We're talking about people speaking the truth of God's goodness and revealing the beauty of his character in the way they relate to other people. That's the glory of God that is going to fill the earth. Now the glory of God is spoken of more directly and specifically with regards to the incarnation. Notice this. The angels in heaven are looking down upon a certain event. The event in this context, in Luke chapter 2, is the birth of Christ, this helpless babe in a manger. The angels of heaven, who have only known him in a position of power and preeminence in the heavenly courts, the angels know his glory in its power configuration, and now they look at this baby in a manger, and they say, whoa, this is the glory of God to what degree? In the highest the incarnation, the condescending, humble coming down of God is the highest manifestation of the glory of God. God is most beautiful in our eyes when he comes down to serve, not when he remains aloof on a throne, separated. God entered into solidarity with the human race. He entered into our pain, our suffering, and coming down into our very flesh, the angels say, now that's glory. The glory of God is manifested in humility. Can I say it to you this way? The God of the universe is the most humble person in the universe. I love going to Australia. I go there every year. And I remember maybe 10 years ago, Upon one of those visits, you know where Australia is, right? It's on the bottom of the earth. It's in the southern hemisphere or the southern part of the earth. Now watch this. I arrive in Australia, and there's a gift shop in the airport. It's a trap, but anyways. So as I go by this gift shop, I see these T-shirts and hats. And, and the Aussies, I mean, they, they have a sense of humor. And all these T-shirts and hats say, welcome to the top of the world. I'm thinking, no, I'm not falling for that. But if you back up from the earth, who's to say where the top and the bottom is? Really. Where is north? Where is south? They're understanding something. When we encounter God in Christ, listen, the top is the bottom and the bottom is the top. We as human beings in our fallen, egocentric, self-serving condition... We imagine, we imagine that up is up and down is down. When the fact is that down is up. That he that is greatest among you is the one who's doing the serving. 
Jesus came and he completely flipped everything on its head and he said, I'll tell you what it looks like to be the most powerful person in any social setting. The most powerful person in any social setting is the one who's doing the serving at what appears to be the lowest position in the social circle. God just happens to occupy that position. God is high and low simultaneously. God occupies the highest position in the universe, and it just happens to be the position of greatest service. And Jesus demonstrates this so that when we come to John chapter 12, not only, according to Luke 2, is the glory of God manifested in the condescending humility of Christ, but check this out. When Jesus goes to Calvary's cross, notice how he articulates his experience of self-sacrificing, self-giving love. He says, speaking of the cross, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be what? Now this is so counterintuitive. We're thinking, what, what do you mean hanging on a cross, bleeding, bloody, dying, by all appearances, completely defeated and humiliated, and this is your glory? It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is his glory. Why? Because as he goes on, he says, not only is he glorified in the sacrifice made at Calvary, but he says, Father, again speaking of Calvary, Father, glorify your name in the cross event. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, on the cross that is, what's going to happen? I will draw people to me on the premise of self-sacrificing love, not on the premise of exercising power and authority over people. In order to draw, to attract, to bring people back to loyalty, God didn't pull a power trip. He didn't pull rank. He didn't say, listen, you rebels. I'm the God of the universe, if you haven't noticed. This is my universe. I call the shots around here. You do what I say or else. If God would have pulled that kind of maneuver, the rebellion would have spun out of control and there would be no hope of redemption. Why? Because God created us as free moral agents with the capacity for love. And we are at our best when we are voluntarily, freely loving. And God, the God of the universe, he just wants one thing from you and me. Freely rendered reciprocal love for all eternity. That's all he wants. God's not a micromanaging control freak. His glory isn't his ego. His glory is his mercy, his grace, the beauty of his goodness. And Jesus becoming incarnate and dying on the cross is the highest most crystal clear, unprecedented, beautiful revelation of God's glory in all of universal history. So much so that what happened at the cross will be our science and our song for all eternity. It will be our science in that it will be our intellectual pursuit. Forever and ever we will be conversing about what happened at Calvary. Forever and ever, we will be in awe and trying to articulate it more clearly. Forever and ever, it will be our science, our intellectual pursuit. But forever and ever, it will be our song. It will be our emotional pursuit through our art, through singing, through poetry. Forever and ever, trying to approximate the glory of God as revealed in Christ. I just love him so much I can't even tell you who or what I would be if God had not gotten hold of my heart. To know God in this light is so absolutely revolutionary and transformative that it completely recharted my personal existence as a teenager. God is beautiful in the extreme. And Jesus proves it beyond all shadow of a doubt. So in chapter 17... He says, Father, I desire that they also, speaking of you and me, Jesus is saying, Father, I want them to be with me where I am. 
He's about to be crucified and leave the world. And he's saying, Father, I want them to be with me where I'm going to be with you so that they can behold my glory. Now that can sound kind of weird. I mean, you can take it one of two ways. Jesus is either saying, Father, I want them to be with me where I am so they can see how great I am and tell me I am. But it's not ego we're dealing with here. God is the most unegocentric person in existence. So Jesus says, Father, I want them to see my glory, which you have given me. And then he defines what that glory is. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. In this text, what is the glory of God synonymous with? The love of God that flows freely between the Father and the Son. Jesus is saying, Father, I want to bring them to heaven. I want to bring them into the kingdom so they can see how we love each other. So that this can come true. The next verse. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, so that the love with which you, Father, have loved me, the Son, may be where? In them and I in them. Jesus says, I want them to be here with you and I, Father, so they can see this tight relationship that you and I have. I want them to see how we love each other so that they can be inducted into this circle of social love. So that they forever can experience what it's like to be in our company and to love like we love. God's glory is his self-giving love, biblically speaking. We didn't make it up. We just discovered it from reading scripture. God's glory is his self-giving love. Sole Dio Gloria is the magnification of God's love before the world. The Protestant Reformation will only be completed when the beauty of God's character becomes the, the subject of paramount interest for us as God's people. On our lips and in our relational dynamics as we deal with one another in our families, in our marriages, the way we deal with one another at the local church level. Can I just speak to you from my heart right now? Listen, everyone here, you're involved in a local church. Everyone here, we're all involved in local churches. My fellow Seventh-day Adventists, enough, enough, enough of manipulation, enough of maneuvering for the highest position, enough of staking out territory in God's church. How dare we? Enough of holding young adults at bay from the church because we're not willing to move aside so that they can be a part of what we're doing because we don't like what they're wearing. Enough, enough of holding the, the song service in a headlock for 38 years. Enough of requiring that people in the community come to us when we should be going to them in serving their needs. The glory of God is going to be revealed when the love of God is manifest in the way we treat one another. In the way we treat one another. So now we come to the Protestant Reformation or the post-Reformation, and this is going to blow your mind. I love this so much that I'm shaking. Okay? This is what we're about to read. This is the Westminster Shorter Catechism, because they had a longer one. They shouldn't have had one, but they did. This is the shorter one. And a catechism is just... An, induct an induction into theological understanding in a question and answer format. That's what a catechism is. Protestant reformers, in the wake of the Protestant Reformation, check this out, they decided to start kind of systematizing what they believe. That was a good idea. They said, hey, let's just map this out so that we can teach people, we can disciple people. And check this out. At the beginning of this thing, one of the question and answers is like this. Here's the question for the new, the new believer, the person that's being indoctrinated. I'd like to indoctrinate you right now. I'm going to indoctrinate us right now with this. What is the chief end of man? Answer, 
to glorify God and enjoy him forever. <laughs> oh, this is incredible. I want you to notice something, that our enjoyment, our enjoyment is intrinsic to God's glory. That in fact, here's the whole Bible in a nutshell. Every night I've taken an effort to give you a snapshot of the Bible in a nutshell. Here's another Bible in a nutshell. Here's the whole text from Genesis to Revelation, from Eden to Eden. Genesis 1 and 2, listen. Genesis 1 and 2, the first two chapters of the Bible, and Revelation 21 and 22, the last two chapters of the Bible, are you listening? Are the only chapters in the Bible that describe what the world looks like without sin in the mix. Are you still with me? So Genesis 1 and 2 describes what it looks like for human beings to live without the egoism that is sin. And what is that place described as? Well, God created the man and the woman, and he put them in a garden called Eden. And the word Eden is a Hebrew word that means, get this, pleasure. That's what it means. He surrounded them with beauty. They could see the profusion of colors and the flowers around them. They could hear the birds flying by and singing to them. They could taste good flavors from the foods that were provided for them, hanging from trees. They could enjoy one another's company with no self-centeredness involved in the equation whatsoever. Wow, Eden is pleasure. Psycho-emotional, biological pleasure. God is the inventor of pleasure. God is the architect of pleasure. God created human beings to only ever experience pleasure. And then sin entered the picture, and the whole, from Genesis 3 straight through to chapter 20 of Revelation is a picture of God navigating evil, navigating evil, which is, according to the biblical perspective, what is evil? Well, evil's a lot of things, but it's at least this. Evil is all unenjoyment. Everything that bumps you out, everything that trips you up, every emotional impulse of insecurity, every time you shift your eyes because you're not sure you have the acceptance of the person that you're talking to, every time you feel like you have to be something in order to get your husband or your wife to love you, every time you feel like you have to measure up in a society that is obsessed with physical appearance to the point of making all of us sick, every time you encounter any emotional, psychological, or physical discomfort of any kind, this is all contrary to the mind and heart and will of God. Revelation 22, 21 and 22 are the only other two chapters in the Bible that describe what reality looks like without sin. It's Eden restored. It's nothing but bliss, 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 and more bliss. No crying, no sorrow, no death. Not even the slightest ripple of emotional insecurity. Do you know what it's like to have a best friend? Somebody that you've known for years and you just, man, you just feel so at home with them. Well, imagine a world in which everybody is at that comfort level with one another. And you get a sense of what it's going to be like, and I can't wait. Ellen White describes it like this. Uh, you're not going to agree with this at first, but I hope that you'll capitulate. All true obedience, that may or may not be a positive word to you, but watch where she goes with it. All true obedience comes from where? From the heart. It was heart work with Christ. That is to say, Jesus came into the world to reach people's what? Hearts, not just to persuade their intellects, not just to get them to behaviorally comply. He was aiming for people's hearts. Now watch this. And if we consent, that's a free will word. 
If we consent, he will so identify with our thoughts and aims. Now, who's doing the identifying here? He will so identify himself. He's identifying first. That's what last night's message was all about. God identifying with us. God not saying, hey, come up here. God saying, no, I'm going to come down there. I'm going to be very close to you. I'm going to feel your feelings. I'm going to shed your tears. I'm going to hold you in my heart and in my arms. Check this out. This is amazing. If we consent, he's going to take the initiative and so identify himself with our thoughts and aims and then so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will. Check this out. That when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. What's that? There's not a person in here who doesn't find that extremely attractive and simultaneously bewildering. Can you imagine having an experience with God in which you do whatever you want to do and the whole time you're doing what he wants you to do? That's called being in love. If you've ever experienced it, you know what it's like. Where two wills come together the Bible calls it the new covenant. And here's how I summarize it. The ideal state of the human being is to live where pleasure and purity align as a single experiential reality. If you want to know what God's after with you, that's what he's after. God is aiming for your heart, for my heart, so that there is an alignment between purity and pleasure so that you only love lovable things and that you hate everything ugly and mean-spirited and horrible and evil and everything that causes pain. So Irenaeus, early church father, Way before the Protestant Reformation, I think he had it right when he said, the glory of God, that's our topic tonight, the glory of God, oh, memorize this with me, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. You want to know what God wants for you and me? He wants you and I to be fully alive. Fully who we're meant to be. He wants you and me experiencing complete, harmonious interaction with him and the beautiful creation around us. He wants you and I swimming along shorelines with dolphins and just off our rockers with happiness because of it. He wants you and I on the backs of elephants enjoying the ride. He wants you and I, the God of the universe wants you and I to have relationships with one another that involve no violations, in which we honor and respect and care for and trust one another. The glory of God is the human person fully alive. So look at it like this, an illustration in closing. Okay, if you have two possibilities, God as ultimate object or self as ultimate object, notice what I've depicted in the illustration. Watch where it goes. To the degree that I move toward myself as ultimate object, living for myself, thinking about myself, doing for myself, to the degree that I move towards self-centeredness, what's happening to all of my powers and abilities? They're all crippling and shrinking. I'm becoming an emotional handicap. I am lessening, but to the degree, check this out, that I move out of myself by the attractive loveliness of the gospel of Christ, and I move out of myself and focus on God as ultimate object, all of my powers and abilities begin to expand. Intellectually, emotionally, relationally, everything gets bigger and brighter and more beautiful when God is the ultimate object. Or let's say it like this. If I believe that the highest plane of reality is occupied by myself, then I will gradually become uglified by my own self-serving urges. But if I believe 
that the highest plane of reality is occupied by a God of self-giving love. Then gradually, I will become beautified by his love. I'll become more like him because he's the ultimate object of my affection and focus. What fuel is to an engine, what oxygen is to a fire, what electricity is to a lamp, what sunshine is to vegetation, God's love is to life. It's the thing you need, you must have it or you perish. And it's the only thing that's going to continue fully sustainable for all eternity. C.S. Lewis said it this way, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself. Why? Because it's just not there. There is no such thing. There is only total satisfaction and fulfillment and happiness the closer, the farther I move out of relationship with God, the darker everything in life becomes. But to the degree that I move to the center of God's glory and give him all my powers and affections, everything becomes brighter and more beautiful. People start to look different. Life is incredible. Everything becomes better. George MacDonald, probably one of the best writers that's ever lived, the guy from whom C.S. Lewis said he got all of his thoughts, he said, is power or love the making might of the universe? What are we dealing with here? Ultimate reality, is it all about power or is it all about love? Check this out. He says, is power or love the making might of the universe, the thing that makes reality tick? He who answers this question aright has the key to all righteous questions. It all boils down to whether or not you perceive God in terms of power over you, or if you perceive God as in condescending love coming under you, serving you. And it will make all the difference in the world. To exalt God to the highest place in our estimation, there's no ego involved. God's not a narcissist. To exalt God to the highest place in our estimation is to place pure other-centered love on the throne of the universe. God's the only person who should occupy the throne because God's the only person who doesn't really care whether he occupies it or not, and Calvary proves it. He came all the way down to demonstrate that power is not where it's at. Where it's at is in love. So that even when we get into the kingdom, my friends, brothers and sisters, when this nightmare is over and we find our feet planted on the eternal shores, the first thing that's going to happen when we get into what we call heaven or the new earth or whatever it is that we're thinking in terms of, when we get into heaven and the new earth, listen to this. This is, this is amazing. We get there and we are, we're, our impulse is get on your face before him. Worship him, adore him, give him glory. And he says, hey, sit down at this table that I prepared for you. Assuredly, Jesus says, I say to you that he, that's God the Father. God the Father will gird himself with an apron and he will have you sit down and he will have you eat and he, the God of the universe, will come and serve us at the table. The people sitting at the table receiving the elevated treatment, it's you and me. And the person with the apron on, according to Jesus, serving the meal is God himself. Why not put this God on the throne? What holds us back from just loving him with every fiber of our being? John Huss had a dream. I had a dream, the prophets of the Bible had a recurring dream. John Huss, when he was in his prison cell, awaiting his execution, had a recurring dream. And in his dream, we're told that this vision that he had distressed him. It distressed him because in his dream, this is amazing, he saw something. 
He saw his church where he had been preaching the gospel with the walls covered with paintings of Jesus that he, with his words, had painted. And he saw enemies of the gospel and of the love of God came in in his dream and tore down all of those pictures he had painted of Jesus with his preaching. So it distressed him. But on the next day, he saw very many painters occupied in restoring these figures in greater number and in, say it out loud with me, brighter colors. As soon as their task was ended, the painters who were surrounded by an immense crowd exclaimed, now let the popes and the bishops come they shall never, they shall never efface them, these portraits of Jesus, they shall never efface these images more. Never again. Huss, in his dream, he realized, wait a minute, there's a movement coming. Something's going to happen in human history. And he interprets his own dream. dream. He says, I maintain this for certain. This is John Huss. I maintain this for certain that the image of Christ will never be effaced. They have wished to destroy it, but it shall be painted afresh in hearts by much better preachers than myself. Brighter colors, brighter colors. John Huss saw in his vision, people, that even though he was about to be burned at the stake, that there would be people who would rise up after, who with their preaching, with their words, with their lives, would paint even more articulate, more beautiful pictures of the God of the universe, and that the truth of his love would eventually triumph, and that the world would be filled with bright and beautiful pictures of the character of God. And that's the movement that you and I have the awesome privilege to be a part of, as prophesied in Revelation 18, 1, final text, after these things, John says, I saw another angel, a messenger, a movement, coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his, what's our key word tonight? His glory. Sole Dio Gloria. The glory of God alone in brighter colors, brighter colors, brighter colors. Through you, through me, through us, the corporate body of Christ, with the privilege of representing the beauty of God's character to the people in our communities and in this world. There is no greater privilege or honor than that. Mm -hmm.